So last night, part one of a four-part documentary series by Vice Media called Who Killed WCW? Part one of four aired, and I got to see it today, and I want to give my thoughts on this because the difference between me and a lot of other people is that I may have a bit of a different opinion than others do about this subject. And it's one that I'm very familiar with because there's been multiple times in my lives where I've taken extreme deep dives into this topic. In fact, there are multiple um, podcasts I've done throughout the years over on the K Fabulous Lucha Brothers show, which is available on iTunes. You can look for it there. And I've talked in the past about WCW shows and I've dove into aspects of it, but I've never really gone, you know, public with every one of my thoughts. It's just stuff I've talked about amongst my friends. I don't really make videos about it, but what better time than now reviewing this documentary. So first and foremost, I want to say that this documentary series is executive produced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who is a member of the board. Now, because he's a member of the board of WWE, that would lead one to believe that the documentary is going to have a WWE skewed perspective. And that's not the case at all. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, at the time of the Monday Night War, was not in any way an executive. He was one of the top guys in WWF, but... Also, he comes off like a guy who isn't afraid to tell the truth on things. I mean, look what happened for WrestleMania this year. He could have just been a prick and kept going with Roman and doing the match with Roman, but he saw what was happening with the fans and he made an adjustment. Now, he kind of was trapped into doing that and he's a smart man, but the reason to why I even bring this up is because if all you've heard about the death of WCW, if all you've heard about is what the WWE's documentaries have told you, you have been fed a lot of bias bullshit. Because both the death of WCW documentary they put out a few years ago, which is not terrible, but it's got some, it's missing a lot. The WCW versus WWF, I think it was called um, the Monday Night War documentary, Raw vs. Nitro, it's like a documentary series. That thing is filled with so much BS. It's like they sprinkle a little bit of truth, then they just completely skew the, the, the story to their favor. They play victim, they act very hypocritical to anybody who knows any better, and they leave out lots of important details. It becomes more a story about how Vince McMahon was able to overcome the billionaire than it was about WCW's mistakes. Trust me, they go into some of them, but there's a lot more that went on behind the scenes. Same thing goes if you saw that terrible 2004 Monday Night War documentary. I own that DVD, and I used to watch it all the time because it's all we had that was like it at the time and it's the only way I was able to see some of that footage this is way before this is like the early the, the early 2000s man this is before like the network you know to get old episodes of wrestling which I had in my possession about a year or two later you had to buy them from websites that are no longer even up anymore right so with that being said you gotta remember the era but that documentary was missing so much. This Vice documentary, at least off the hop, has all the right people. The only people in this that were, I would say, pro-WWE, or at least people who weren't even in WCW, is The Rock. You've got Eric Bischoff on this. You've got Kevin Nash. You've got Kevin Sullivan, who has not appeared on many of the WWE documentaries. He needed to. He was the booker. You've also got Janie Engel and people from Turner. Brad Siegel is in this documentary. These are people that were very important people that worked for Turner Networks during the WCW era that needed to be interviewed. People who WWE does not think is important because it's more of a corporate thing. But what one has to understand is the death of WCW. Everybody wants to point the finger and say it was Vince Russo or Eric Bischoff or Hulk Hogan or Kevin Nash. In reality, it was a multitude of people. But the one thing nobody ever wants to talk about is the fact that there was a lot that was going on above WCW with their parent company, Turner Broadcasting, 
and the Turner Networks. There is a lot to that story that was not revealed until Guy Evans' book, Nitro. Now, if you have not read the book, first of all, Guy Evans is in this documentary. When I saw him, I immediately knew we'd get an unbiased perspective from at least him. From at least him, because... Eric Bischoff narrates a lot of this documentary, not necessarily as the narrator, but he is the guy who, because he was so important to the rise of that company, he had to tell his story. And there, there's some BS I'm going to get into in a minute, but uh, Guy Evans' book Nitro is one of the best wrestling books ever written, and it goes into what was going on from the corporate structure. People don't really understand that the merger of Turner and Time Warner, and then later on AOL Time Warner, that entire story is glossed over by wrestling fans who I think just want the simple narrative and don't ever want to go into the business stuff. If you've been following me for any length of time, you know that I'm fascinated with business stuff. I am a business owner, certainly not one that's anywhere near the size of WCW. It's a small business, but I've always been interested in bigger businesses, how they work, how they function, and what goes on. And that's an aspect that wrestling fans, they always want to point the finger and say it was just Eric Bischoff or it was just Vince Russo or it was the fact that WWF came back. All those things may have been a factor. The big contracts, the big stars, the the guaranteed money, all of that stuff, right? The, even the bad booking, all of these things were factors but the one thing that is never talked about enough is the corporate problems going on at Turner and how that led to WCW getting kicked out the door. And this documentary, at least with part one, they don't go too much into that yet. But there are some sprinkles of hints of things to come because Brad Siegel himself talks about how he built up TNT. And from what I understand, Brad Siegel and Eric Bischoff did have a good friendship like they got along business wise but Brad Siegel admits in this documentary he never wanted wrestling on TNT he was in charge of TNT the network they had at the time NBA they actually had NFL people forget man there was a time in the 90s when the NFL was on TV on TNT excuse me TBS had baseball uh the Braves baseball so uh, that right there goes to show that a big part of this story is that the Turner executives did not want WCW and many of them were working to undermine the existence of WCW above even Bischoff's head. And that's something that Bischoff has talked about. And look, you can sit there and say that Eric Bischoff is a liar and there are some definite things in this documentary that he says that I call BS on, but I don't think he's lying about everything. I think he's being honest about what went on. And I think the Guy Evans book with eyewitness interviews goes even deeper into it, and this documentary seems to as well. Besides that interesting part of it, this documentary, at least part one, went through the motions of, or episode one, went through the motions of stuff we always hear about. The early days, Bischoff in the AWA, uh, the, a little tiny bit on the Bill Watts era, Bischoff comes in and takes over to become the executive producer, he signs Hulk Hogan, eventually turns him heel, the beginning of Nitro. You've heard these stories a gazillion times, I'm sure, from God knows how many podcasts out there. There's a story that Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez stick to that differs from what Wade Keller says, but not entirely. There's All, all these points have been pretty publicly known, right? It's the deeper stuff I'm curious about. And there's a little bit of that here. However, Bischoff saying he did not know what WCW was when he was in AWA is very hard to believe considering that NWA, he definitely knew what NWA was at least. And in the early days of, of his time in the AWA, it was still the NWA, even though by that time it had been bought by Turner. But there's no way that I believe he didn't know what NWA was because he was in the wrestling business with Vern Gagne in AWA. And even though Vern probably hated Vince a lot more than he did the NWA, he knew it existed. He had to have known. Plus, don't forget that there was also the Pro Wrestling USA thing, and that was a little bit before then. It's just, I don't, I find it hard to believe that Bischoff did not know what WCW was. But I think his point was, it was not, what wrestling was to people. Wrestling was the WWF because of Hulk Hogan and the rise of the WWF in the 80s. That's all true. 
He then says the one thing that he said oftentimes that I'm always skeptical about is the meeting he had with Ted Turner, where he says, you know, where Ted asks him, he wants to compete with Vince, and Bischoff always does the impression about how Turner gave him two hours on Monday nights on TNT. That's not true, because Nitro was one hour. It was one hour, and then it became two hours later on. It didn't become two hours till 96. It's a small thing. It's not really the point of the story, but it is something to where these are things that I find hard to believe as somebody who studied this. Now, Booker T is interviewed for this. Uh, Hulk Hogan was surprisingly, I haven't seen him on this one, not in part one, but uh, Vince Russo's interviewed. I'm sure he'll have thoughts on that because he, he worked for them. Several different executives. Uh, Kevin Nash is interviewed, and they obviously talk about the early days of Kevin Nash in the NWO, and even before the NWO when he was Oz, and the idea behind how his career had floundered. A little bit on Scott Hall. DDP is on this documentary, but because Scott Hall's no longer with us, then, of course, DDP kind of tells the Scott Hall story because that was his running buddy before Hall and Nash kind of became, they became friends too. You know, they were all part of the same group. You know, not... Not even the click. Even before the click was the click, DDP had a very good relationship with all those guys, including Triple H. I mean, everybody loves Dally, right? So um, already from the hop, I can tell this is going to be a much more balanced perspective. It's not going to be Gerald Briscoe. Well, don't mess with Vince McMahon. It's not going to be any of that. This at least comes off like not only do you have people that were in the offices at Turner Broadcasting and people who worked both directly for WCW or with WCW, Guy Evans, and you've got talent. So it's And it's not supervised by WWE. That's the important thing. And with Vince McMahon being gone, I think, and Kevin Dunn, the fact that Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn are both gone, that tells me that documentaries from now on are going to have a lot less of that small dick energy that Vince has where he has to lie about how... how terrible he was as a, as a person putting people out of business but then whining when WCW tried to do it to him playing the victim I've always hated that and it's always been Kevin Dunn and Vince McMahon who have powdered each other when it came to making sure WCW was buried and forgotten when they could have made a lot of money in that invasion angle had it not been for Kevin Dunn meddling and creative but that's a whole other story the point is that this already seems like a more balanced documentary. Vice has been shady in the past with some of their other projects, but Dark Side of the Ring, for the most part, I haven't watched a new season yet, but that seems to be pretty accurate and honest. So, um, so far this one is too, and I love Tales of the Territory. So, I'm actually very happy that Vice is doing these documentaries because I think they're, they're fun learning experiences for new fans and old fans. So the documentary covers all the way through about Sting's title reign and then kind of like the when Sting won the title from Hogan, they kind of breezed through a lot of that. They didn't go into any specific episodes or, you know, Nitro going to three hours, which may be talked about in the next uh, episode because Thunder expanding and Nitro being given another hour uh, and, you know, Thunder being created, really, the expansion of those two things uh, that was kind of another thing that Bischoff himself says was a problem, and I kind of see that point too because it does dilute the product. It definitely did dilute the product. WCW Saturday Night used to be the B show, and it became very quickly the C show when Thunder started because that was the B show. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Goldberg's story has not been told yet, or Bret Hart's. Um, right now, they kind of left off it's not really going in super chronological order, but it's almost implied now we're in 97 because the WWF got creatively smarter and started getting, you know, started gaining, you know, momentum. And I'm guessing 98 and 99 will be covered in the second part or at least most of, of those two years because to me, those years are actually the most interesting. I think 2000 WCW, people say that the Vince Russo era was fascinating because of how fast it nosedived. But to me, the most interesting thing is 99 because that's when the decline really started. Plus, in 99, throughout most of the year, there was still a chance to kind of bring the nose up. But by the time you get to the second half of the year, 
when you get to like July, August, September of 99, that's when WCW got straight up boring. And I can tell you that because I was around in, I think nine, that I was just starting high school when this happened. People were really into WWF. But man, people, Nitro was still doing its best. But actually, no, it might have been starting 10th grade. But still, it doesn't matter. Uh, people were really losing interest in WCW around that time. I remember the summertime, like, people would miss entire Nitros and not care. They'd miss months of TV and not care. Like, but WWF was must-see TV every week. So, like, you know, that's going to be interesting to see how they cover that because I want to know, because, you know, everything's fine. When a company's doing great, everything's fine. And that's the thing. And that's the one argument Melter's always made. Well, if WCW had bigger ratings, they would have never been put out of business by Jamie Kellner and Turner and AOL Time Warner because it was giving them eyeballs. Well, that's the thing. It was still giving them eyeballs. I mean, even WCW at its worst was still doing better numbers than Dynamite does now. And Nitro was a way worse show in that last year than most Dynamites are. And I've been critical of Dynamite too, but those Nitros were just bad. So, and they still had like two to three million people watching. There was still an audience there. You know, there were people that were just loyal Turner wrestling fans who probably watched like, you know, Crockett and all these other territorial wrestling companies during their time in the 80s who just kept watching. Some of them were watching 20 years. You know, and it would they were just always into their Southern wrestling, which was WCW. Even though it became an international company, it was grounded and rooted in the South. Originally, the continent, the continent, the, the the Carolinas, excuse me, continental Carolinas, um, Crockett, Georgia, Florida, Alabama. That was like WCW territory up to Virginia and Baltimore. And up above that was WWF territory for a long time. It was like that. It wound up changing when everything ended, but nevertheless. I enjoyed this first part. I hope that we get more answers of the from other people of what was going on behind the scenes. Because that's the most interesting thing. We already know that TV started to suck in 99. We already know that Goldberg was a huge star that they messed up with. I mean, I'm sure they're going to cover that because Goldberg and Nash are on here. And I'm sure that'll be discussed. And they're also teasing that, you know, the inmates ran the asylum, which is, you know, people have been saying AEW's like that now. I mean, I don't know, but people have been making comparisons. So those are my thoughts. What'd you think about this Vice documentary? Let me know in the comments below.